evening, let us stand, and I want us to go to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, and verse number 8. Nehemiah, chapter 2, and verse number 8. And I want to preach and minister to us today on the blessing and power of the hand. And of course, when I speak about the hand, I am speaking about the hand of God. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 8. The Bible says, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And look what the latter part of this verse says, and this is what I want you to understand. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. According to the good hand of my God upon me. And I want to minister on the blessing and the power of the hand. And everybody say, God bless your word to our hearts. Amen. Amano Ishmael, pray over the word. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Too many times people look at themselves and they look at what they have or what they don't have and they determine by what they see or but what by what they don't see if they can do a work for God, if they can live for God, if they can serve God. And when they look at what they have, and when they look at what they don't have, they compare it to the task of their calling, they compare it to the task of the work, and they compare it to the place that God wants to use them. And so when they see or they don't see, based on what they have and what they don't have, and they compare it to what is before them, what they know they ought to do, whether living for God, whether serving God, fulfilling a place in the church, then they begin to feel inadequate within their spirit. They begin to feel inadequate within their life. And they are not up to the task, or they say they are not up to the task, and they don't have the, the ability to be the vessel of God. And maybe you sitting here tonight, God is dealing with you. God is speaking to your heart. God is speaking to your soul. God is speaking to your mind about something. And you say, well, I really don't have that ability, or I don't have as much as I need to have, or I really don't know if I can live for God. I don't know if I have that with inside of me, the stamina and the faith that I need to have to accomplish, to fulfill, to live for God in the way that God wants me to live. I don't know if I have the ability, I don't know if I have the stamina to do the work that God wants me to do. When God begins to speak something into your heart, when God puts a dream for you to follow, when God gives you a calling to heed to, when God puts a specific work within your life, or God begins to deal with you to sell out completely to him and live for him and begin to do the things that he wants you to accomplish within your life, then be rest assured, have the peace of mind, have the peace of heart that God is going to provide all things. Everybody say all things. Amen. He will provide all things that are necessary for you to fulfill his plan, his will, and his word. It does not matter the situation. I don't care what it is. When God gives you a calling, God gives you a purpose, God gives you a work, God begins to deal with you, to develop a deeper relationship and a deeper walk with God. Don't allow the spirit of inadequacy. Don't allow what you see or what you don't see to build up a wall and to put hindrances around you or to tie you or to chain you down because you need to remove that out of your mind. God is going to give to you and God is going to provide to you all things. Amen. Everybody say all things once again. Amen. That are necessary for you to fulfill his plan, for you to fulfill 
fulfill his work for you to fulfill the calling of God. That's the way God is. That is the way God is. And we need to understand that and we need to believe that and we need to put it within our spirit. We need to put it in our heart, amen, so that we are not lacking in anything. There are too many people that are lacking. There are too many people that are empty because they do not believe, amen, that God can use me. They will look at somebody else and they say, well, God can use them. God can touch them. God can help them, amen, but God can't do it for me. Let me tell you, if he can do it for your neighbor, he can do it for you as well. And God is not going to put anything in your spirit. God is not going to put anything in your heart, anything in your mind, amen, that you cannot do, that you cannot fulfill, and that you cannot work in your life for the kingdom. Melissa, go to uh, the search there in the scripture and type in, amen, um, I, I can't think of it, I know it's in Peter, but I was trying to look for it, amen, he gives to us all things unto life and godliness, put uh, life and godliness in there, amen, and see if it pulls it up, it'll be in Peter, in Jesus' name, or all things, all promises, something like that, in the name of the Lord, praise God. God gives us blessing, God gives us strength, God gives us ability, God God gives us anointing, amen, that I can do the work. I can do, amen, the, I can do the calling. I can have the anointing of God in my life and on my life, amen. And we look at Nehemiah and we say, well, Nehemiah was a great man. Nehemiah was a mighty man. Nehemiah was a man that was used abundantly and mighty of God. Yes, he was used abundantly and mighty of God, but Nehemiah was no different than you and me. Do you understand that? Nehemiah was no different than you and me. Where's it at? Second Peter what? Second Peter 1 and 3. Amen. Throw that up. I want to read that scripture in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody say hallelujah. Amen. According as his divine power has given unto us. Everybody say unto us. That's not only us as the body collectively, but that is you as an individual as well. All things, say all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So as we know him, and this is more than just a head knowledge, but yet it is a knowing him, it is a, a relationship, it is a walk with God, amen. I know him intellectually, but yet I also know him through my faith and by my belief I know him because I have a walk with him. I know his voice, I hear his voice, I yield my to his voice and because of this I know that God gives me all things according to his power amen and if God gives me all things according to his power then I know I'm going to be able to accomplish it I know I'm going to be able to do the job I know I'm going to be able to walk with God I know I'm going to be able to do what God has called me to do amen that pertain unto life and unto godliness. So not only the natural does he give me these blessings, not only the natural does he give me these promises, but yet also for the spiritual aspect, for the spiritual life, for the spiritual walk and the spiritual work that God wants me to do. And so Nehemiah understood this. Nehemiah understood this. He was just an ordinary man. He was not something spectacular because Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 11, the last five words of this verse says, For I was the king's cup bearer. He was not a general. He was not a mighty man of valor. He was not one of the statesmen. He was not one of the religious leaders. He was not one, amen, that the king would go to to get wisdom and knowledge and direction. He was a cupbearer, amen. The cupbearer to the king was what you and I would basically call a butler, amen, or a waiter, one that would serve the food, or his, his, his job was to serve the drink. And not only was he a cupbearer, but he was one of many, 
many cupbearers because King Ahasuerus had more than one. So in reality, to say that Nehemiah in the kingdom of Ahasuerus, in the kingdom of the Persians, amen, was some mighty man. No, he was ordinary. He's just like you. He was just like me. He was a cupbearer. He was not an architect. He was not a warrior. Compared to the generals, compared to the statesmen of the court, Nehemiah was not really that important. Amen. And the important people probably would look over him and not even acknowledge him because he was just an ordinary person. But yet Nehemiah knew, hey, I've got a God on my side. I've got a God that walks with me. i got a God that lives with me. And when God put something in my heart and God put something in my spirit, no matter what that calling is, no matter what that objective is, whether to do a work or to live for him, to witness, to testify, to sing, to teach, amen, to minister, to do whatever, God is going to give me the ability, amen, God is going to give me the strength to do it. And somebody say amen. Nehemiah had a burden, and Nehemiah had a passion. For the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning with verse number 3, amen, that when his brother and some men of Judah came back to Babylon from Jerusalem, they took a journey to Jerusalem, came back to Babylon, Nehemiah inquired of them what's happening in Jerusalem, what's happening in my hometown. What's happening in my home country? And verse number three says, And they said unto me, The remnant, that's talking about the people that are left of captivity, that are in the providence, are in great affliction and reproach. In other words, the people that are, they're in bad shape. Amen. They are in bad shape. They are in great affliction. There, there are a lot of problems that are coming upon them, a lot of pressing things, a lot of opposing forces that are coming upon them. And they are the reproach of the earth. They are the reproach of the other people that have infiltrated the land. People laugh at them. People mock at them. People criticize them. And then verse, uh, the, and the Bible says, and then the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates are of are burned with fire. To you and I here tonight, that really doesn't mean anything. But yet, a city that did not have any walls, a city that did not have any gates was not a city. It was not a strong city. It was not something to be proud of. So not only were the people in reproach and in great affliction, Jerusalem was the laughing stock because they had no way to defend themselves. They had no way, amen, to protect from an invasion of the army. The walls were torn down. The gates were burned. Amen. And so it was seemingly like a hopeless case. And look what Nehemiah said in verse number four. And he said, and it came to pass when I heard these words, when I heard that the people of God were in affliction, when I heard that they were facing a reproach, when I heard the situation of my town, Jerusalem, lying in ruins, lying in dust with the walls and the gates torn down, the Bible says, he sat down and he wept, and he mourned certain days and fasted <coughs> and prayed before the God of heaven. A cupbearer, not a great man, not a preacher, not a prophet, not a statesman, not a king, not a prince, not a political figure, not a religious figure, just an ordinary man that was doing his job, a cupbearer, a butler, a waiter on a table. When he heard these words, the Bible says that he wept and he mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Why? Because he had a passion. He had a burden. God was putting something with inside of him. And he was not going to say, well, I'm just a cup barrel. What can I do? I don't have the ability. I don't have the money. I, I don't have the education. I don't have the political co uh, connections, amen, to help the people. I, I don't have anything to build up the walls. I'm not an architect. I'm not a contractor. I'm not a builder. I can't do it. Oh, no. Nehemiah did not have this type of thinking. Nehemiah went to the throne room of God. And I'm afraid that's where we miss it sometimes. We feel so inadequate. I can't live for God. I can't serve God. I'll never achieve anything in God. I can't do a work for God. Because we look at what we have 
or we look at what we don't have. And when God tries to speak to us and God tries to move on us to do something, what do we do? We build up the wall. We build up the obstacle. But what we need to do is do like Nehemiah. Let that burden and let that passion get a hold of our heart that I'm going to find a place and pray. I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to pour my soul out to God because even though physically, even though financially, even though intellectually, I may not have the ability, I've got a God that if God calls me, God can give me all things that pertain unto life and godliness that I can do the work that God wants me to do. Do. We can look at our church. We'll use tonight as an example. Amen. Where is everybody tonight? Sunday we had a decent crowd. We'd have been over 100. Amen. If everybody would have been here. Amen. But we, we had a good crowd Sunday morning considering. And But here we are tonight. Well, what can I do about it? You know, what can I do about it? I can't win souls. I can't talk to someone about Jesus. I really can't do anything. Oh, but you can pray. You can allow the burden to get a hold of your heart. Amen. You can begin to weep. You can begin to fast. Amen. You can allow Jesus to talk to you, that you can find a place and pray, and you can weep, and you can call out to God, and you can pray for the church. You can pray for the saints of God. You can pray for the backslider. You can pray for the sinner. You can pray for our 20 plus 5 mile area radius. Amen. You can pray for these things and say, God, take me, and God, use me. I may not have the ability, but if God puts that dream with inside of you, if God puts that calling inside of you, you can accomplish much in him because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. We need to go beyond just sitting here and hearing it and saying amen and clapping our hands and shaking our head and say, I believe it. Begin to do something about it. What was Nehemiah going to do? Nehemiah was going to pray, and Nehemiah was going to seek his God. So Nehemiah, he did two things. He prayed for his people, his nation, and his city. And as he was praying for his people, his nation, and his city, the first thing he did was reminded God of God's promises. The second thing he did, amen, he also stood as an intercessor, amen, to Jesus Christ. Let's flip those around. Actually, amen, he, he did both at the same time. He became an intercessor. That's why the Bible says he prayed, he mourned, he wept, and he fasted, amen, for certain days. It was not just going to be a five-minute prayer. It was not just going to be a simple prayer, but he was going to get a hold of God. And as he was praying, he was reminded. God of the promises that God gave unto the children of Israel. Let's read verse number 5 of Nehemiah chapter 1. And he said, I beseech thee, Lord, O God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy unto them that love him and observe his commandments. How many times through Deuteronomy, how many times through the book of Psalms, amen, did God tell, amen, and written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Keep his word. Keep his commandments. Walk in his word. Walk in his commandments. And if you do, I will make a covenant. I will make promises. I will show you blessing and grace. Then he goes on to say, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house has sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So here within these four, or within these scriptures, we can find him reminding, amen, God of his promise. We can see that as he wept and he mourned and fasted and prayed for certain days, amen, he was standing in the gap. He was standing as a vessel, God. I want you to forgive me. I want you to open up your ear and hear my prayer as we confess our sin and I confess my sin unto you. Verse number eight, he said, remember, here he is again reminding the Lord. I beseech thee the word that thou hast commanded thy servant Moses, saying, 
If you, tres- or if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Verse number 9. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though you were, or though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence. So he was reminding God of the promise that if the people of Israel would come to a place of repentance by the promise and the word of God, God was going to bring restoration. God was going to bring restitution. We as the church of this town, we have promises that God has given to us. You know what they are. But are we praying them? Are we using our life as an intercessor? Are we believing God that we are going to pray and we are going to seek God? And not only am I an intercessor, not only am I allowing the burden of the hour and the burden of the day to get a hold of my spirit and get a hold of my heart, but I am also going to remind God of his promise. I am also going to stand upon the word of God and claim his promise. Amen. Does not the Bible say that Jesus is our advocate? He is our lawyer. So when we remind him of what the word says, amen, his word is law, the covenant is law, amen, and he has to fulfill, amen, the promises of his word. Verse number 10, now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand, O Lord. I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee that thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. The question is asked, well, why do we need to remind God of his promises? Does God not remember them? Oh, no, he remembers them. But he wants us to see if we remember them. And that if we will have the faith to stand upon them and continuously bring them before the throne of God. Will we step up to the plate? Will we step up by faith and be bold enough in prayer to say, Hey God, this is what you have promised. You say, well, Brother Use Pan, I, I would like to have a scripture. Amen, to say it's all right to remind God of his promises. I'm going to give you one. Isaiah chapter 62 and verse number 6. The Bible says, I have set a watchman upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. What is the watchman representative of? Well, they are the guards of the city. And they proclaim and they testify, amen, of enemies that are coming to protect the people, amen, or to get them ready for warfare. And so in the spiritual sense, the watchman on the wall would also be the intercessor that I am going to speak, I am going to pray, I am going to be that person that is going to stand between the congregation and between my God. Because God can use me. God can work through me to do a will and fulfill a will and fulfill a purpose. And the Bible goes on to say, which shall never, these watchmen shall never hold their peace day or night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. So as a watchman, don't hold your peace. Continue to shout out. Continue to pray. Continue to, amen, bring forth the petitions unto God. Amen. When you mention the name of the Lord, remind him of it. Don't keep silent. Because verse number 7 says, and give him, speaking about the Lord, no rest. In other words, I am going to pound the doors of heaven. Jesus, I am not going to give you any rest because I am going to be an intercessor. And as an intercessor, I am going to stand in the gap because there is a burden that has been placed upon my heart. There is an unction that has been placed upon me that I can begin to fulfill the will of God. I can begin to do the will of God. I can live for God. I can serve God. I can do a work for God. There is an anointing that God is placed upon me and I am not going to allow my limitations I am not going to allow myself and how I feel about a certain situation to hold me back I will stand upon the word of God and the Bible says the watchman on the walls to give him no rest till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth (coughs) I want us to read verses 6 and 7 in the amplified version 
and it's on our next uh, slide. The Bible says, I have set a watchman upon your walls of Jerusalem who will never hold their peace day or night, who you are his servants and by your prayers. You are the servants and by your prayers you put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. You are reminding God of his promises and you are not keeping silent. And verse number seven, and you give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her praise in the earth. And so this is what Nehemiah was doing. I'm just a cupbearer. I'm just a butler. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I don't have education. I am not a popular person. But yet God has put a burden. God has put a passion in my soul. Amen. To see the fulfillment of the promises. And I am not going to allow them to slip through my fingers. But I am going to rise up to the plate. I am going to step up to the plate. Amen. And I am going to pray. And I am going to seek God. And I'm not going to keep silent about it, but I am going to pound the throne of heaven until he establishes Jerusalem. Amen. Until he brings it to pass and makes her a praise in the earth. And if they could do that for the Jerusalem, can we not do it for the church of the living God? Everybody say amen. I want to share something with you today. I was on the phone for about two and a half hours this morning with a preacher that I have never met personally. I've talked many times on the phone with. And we have developed a relationship. And he told me, he said, Brother Yuzapan, and he told me some other things. But he said, the reason why these things are about to happen, that's going to happen, is because the people in your church, and he's never been here. He does not know any of you. The people in your church, they want revival. They want the promises of God to happen. They want to see, but they're slow to change. And because of their slowness and their spirit, amen, not getting a hold of it and running with it and believing it, the actuality of it, when they're slow to change, that's throwing up opposition to the moving and the spirit of God. And he said, because of that, some things are going to happen. Some things are going to happen. And so I've already, I have already had this message prepared. I had it prepared Monday. Amen. I got in here Monday. I just started working left and right. Man, I was just knocking it out. Amen. I was doing real good. Praise God. Very rare for a Monday. Amen. Then he told me that. And I said, God, we've got to, can't, we cannot be silent, but we've got to shout. We've got to pray. We've got to seek God. We've got to step up to the plate. We cannot allow someone else to do it. That calling and that responsibility has been placed upon the saints of this church. Amen. And either we are going to step up to the plate or God's going to do something else. Everybody say amen. The watchmen are the walls of the intercessor. They see the need. That's approaching. They see the need. They see the danger. They are the voice. They are the voice of warning. And they stand before the throne of God as intercessor and they call out to God consistently, not giving God any rest until the promises come to pass. And to be an intercessor, if we are going to be an intercessor, listen to me, it's not just going to be, well, praise God, I'm going to be an intercessor and pray for 30 minutes and say, well, I'm done interceding. No, 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 no. To be an intercessor, it takes dedication, amen, that I am going to pray until God answers. Whether it takes a day, whether it takes two days, whether it takes five days, whether it takes ten days, whether it takes six months, I am going to stand on the wall. I am going to shout. I am not going to keep silent. I am going to remind God of his promises, amen. I am going to remind him until he establishes and brings the past what God said he is going to bring to pass. So it takes dedication to the point that I will pray until God answers. <clears throat> it also takes a commitment that, God, I'll pray when you want me to pray. If you wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll pray. If you tell me at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll pray. If it's 8 o'clock in the evening, 8 o'clock in the morning, whenever, dear God, I am committed because I'm going to pray. This is what Nehemiah did. 
Amen. He prayed, he mourned, and he fasted for seven days because the burden was in his heart. The burden was in his spirit. Here I am, just a nobody, but God is doing a work in my life. God is calling me, amen, to get beyond, the out of this area that I'm in and begin to do a work. And so he ended verse 4, God, I ask that you give me favor with him, favor with the king, for I am the king's cupbearer. And also to be an intercessor takes focus to zero in on what you need to pray for. So to be an intercessor takes dedication. An intercessor takes commitment. An intercessor takes focus. And this is what Nehemiah did. Another scripture that shows us, amen, that it's all right to remind God of his promises and come continually before the throne of God is this very familiar portion of scripture in Luke chapter 18, verse number 2. The Bible says, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God nor regarded man. This, this judge was a crooked judge. He just served to serve himself. Well, the Bible says he didn't fear God. He didn't care about the statutes of God. He didn't care about the righteousness of God. He didn't regard man. He didn't care what man said. He was going to do what he wanted to do no matter what anybody thought. Sounds like some of our politicians today. Amen. But the Bible says in verse number three, there was a widow in that city, and she came unto the judge and said, Avenge me and my adversary. But because he was crooked and because he didn't care, he just blew her off. But the Bible says, and he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God nor regard man. This was even his own testimony. I don't care about God. I don't care about man. But because this little widow is troubling me, She's bothering me. She's aggravating me. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? This judge was crooked. He didn't fear God. He was going to do what he wanted to do. But here was this woman that had the law on her side. Here was this woman that wrong was done unto her. And this judge was not going to answer her. This judge was not going to give her her day in court. But this woman knew what the law was. This woman knew she was in the right. And so every day, amen, when court was there, amen, or maybe she went to his chambers, I don't know, but every day, amen, or maybe every other day, whatever it was, she came, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me of this wrong, and because she was persistent, the judge didn't care about her. The judge didn't give a flip about her and her situation, but because of her persistence and her, I'm not going to say stubbornness, but her steadfastness, she sought God, or she sought the judge, and the judge answered. When I was talking with this preacher today, he made a statement he said the people of God, speaking about the people of God collectively as a body, they are either stubborn, and stubborn feeds the flesh, and stubbornness will build up a wall of resistance against God, because the Bible says stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. Or, he said, on the flip side of the coin, you have someone that is being steadfast and unmovable. And the difference between stubborn and being steadfast, one feeds the flesh and one feeds the spirit. And when he said that, I said, oh, wow, that's powerful. What we need to do as children of God, instead of being stubborn to fight against God, God, I'm going to be steadfast in your promises. I know what the law says. I know what the promises say. I know what you have given to me, and I am going to stand upon the word. You said you're going to heal me, God. I'm going to remind you of it every day. I'm going to come before the throne of God. Lord, you said you're going to bless me financially. Amen. I'm going to stand upon that promise. I'm going to come before you every day. Lord, you said, amen, our church is going to have favor. Our church is going to have revival. I'm going to stand on that promise, and I'm going to come before you every day. 
every day. God, you said I can live for you even though my flesh says I can't, even though the devil says I'm a failure. Guess what? I'm going to live for you because I'm going to be steadfast and I'm going to be unmovable in the work of the Lord, always abounding in that work. And so this is what this woman did. So she, she was done wrong, done wrong. She was done wrong. People did wrong to her and hurt her. But she was not going to put up with it. And so she went constantly, I want my justice. I want my fair treatment. I want you to protect me. And I want you to defend me against the adversary according to the law. Folks, we've got some promises. We've got some covenant. Amen. So as the watchman of the wall from Isaiah, amen, to Luke chapter 18, we are going to stand on the wall and we are going to shout. We are going to be like Nehemiah and we are going to pray. Amen. We are going to shout until God brings that peace. Amen. Until God brings that restoration. Until God brings that anointing. We cannot sit back anymore and say, well, what will be? What will be? No, Masa Menos. Amen. We are either going to be on fire for God or we're going to be lost. Amen. Amen. And so God gave the analogy. Look at the judge. Will I not even do more for the children that cry unto me day and night? But a lot of times the reason we don't have is because we quit praying. We quit praying after the first day, after the first two days, after the first five days, after the first week. But an intercessor is dedicated that I'm going to pray until God answers. <clears throat> I'm going to be committed, amen, that I'll pray when you want me to pray. And then I'm going to focus on what the need is, amen. And I am going to focus on it, and I'm going to do it. And so after Nehemiah got done praying, guess what? Nehemiah went to work. Now, I don't know if he was praying and fasting, if he took some time off. I don't know. I don't know if he called in sick. I don't know. But the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. And the Bible says, now I have never been sad before in his presence. He never was sad in the presence of the king. Verse number 2, so the king said unto me, why do you look sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of the heart. Then the Bible says he was very much afraid. Why was he afraid? Because you just didn't show your emotions in front of a king. Because the king would kill you if he wanted to. You were supposed to have a positive attitude. You were supposed to have a positive outlook. But there was something different about Nehemiah this time. That even though he was sad because of the word that he received about Jerusalem, how the people were and the walls were, it affected him. And he was afraid because he didn't know how the king was going to respond. His life was on the line. Verse number 3, And Nehemiah said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should I not be sad? Here he is stepping up to the plate, being bold. Why should I not be sad faced when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lies in waste and its gates are consumed by fire? Well, it was the predecessors of Artaxerxes that caused this problem. Do you realize that? It was the kings that came before Artaxerxes, amen, you read in Daniel, amen, that caused this problem. And here, Nehemiah was a captive. He was a slave in Babylon. And he was telling the king, I'm sad because of what's happened at home. Well, that was dangerous for him to do that. But Nehemiah didn't stop there. Through faith and boldness, he recognized the calling on his heart that God gave to him. And verse number four, then the king said to Nehemiah, for what do you ask? So I pray to the God of heaven. Verse number five, and I said, Nehemiah said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you will send me to Judah to the city of my father's sepulchers that I may rebuild it. A butler, a cupbearer, a waiter that lives by minimum wage eh, or below minimum wage and accepts tips. This was his job. The king of all the realm said, well, what do you want? But because he prayed, because he fasted, because he mourned before God, God put something within his spirit and said, I want you to allow me to go back home to build the city. 
the king could have said, well, Nehemiah, you're not a builder. You're not an architect. You're, you're, you're not a construction contractor. You don't know the first thing about it. And if the king would have said that, Nehemiah probably would have said, yeah, that's true. But God's put it in my heart. Verse number six. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by, how long are you going to be on your journey and when will you return? The king didn't say, well, you couldn't do it. You can't do it. You don't have the ability. You don't have the money. You don't have the funds. You're not educated in that way. You're not, you're not, you're not connected politically with anybody. You're just a butler. He said, ah, how long are you going to be gone? And when are you going to come back? And so it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Listen to me. The blessing and the power of the hand of God upon you will begin to do a work in your life that you never could imagine. You can live for God. You can serve God. You can be a witness. You can be a prayer warrior. You can be an intercessor. You can teach a Bible study. Amen. You can see your family say, we can see this church full. But are you at the point and are you at the place that you will pray and seek God? That you will not allow what you have or what you don't have to be the hindrance in your life. Nehemiah, once again, I want to drive it home. He was not an architect. He was not a contractor. He was not a builder. All he was was a butler. But it doesn't matter who you are when the hand of God is upon you. Because Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 8, the last portion of that verse says, According, amen, to the good hand of my God upon me. When you begin to operate and you begin to flow and you begin to move in the spirit of God, when God's hand is upon you, you can begin to accomplish. You can begin to do mighty things. God will put you in the place that God wants you to be in. Amen. God can begin to flow through you. God can begin to work for you. And when the hand of God is upon you, don't make excuses and say I can't do it. Yes, you can do it because the favor and the power and the blessing of God is upon you. <coughs> so, Nehemiah not only asked time off from work to rebuild the city, but he also got a holy boldness about him. And he said in verse number 7, he said, I said unto the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors beyond the Euphrates River that they may let me pass through to Judah. What is this man? He's saying, king, I need your protection. I need your, I need your protection. So I'm asking you to give me letters that will give me protection by your authority on my way from Babylon to Jerusalem. That was mighty bold. That was bold to come before the king. Oh, I, you know, I want the time off to build my city, but not only that, I want you to give me letters of protection. And so the king gave it to him. But you know what? He didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. But he allowed the holy boldness to continue even more. For in verse number 8, and he said, And give a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest or park, that he might give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple. That was the church. That was the tabernacle. And for the city wall and for the house that I shall occupy. In other words, he's saying, King, not only do I want you to let me take time off, not only do I want letters of protection, but I also want you to supply me with the materials to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city walls, and to build a house that I'm going to live in. Now, you talk about boldness. That's pretty bold. Here was a man that was not a builder. Here was a man that was not an architect. Here was a man, amen, that had no contractual experience about him. But he said, King, I want to go. I want to build. I want to build the city. And I want you to give me the funds. I want you to give me the money, amen, to do it with. And the king did it because what did the Bible say? And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The favor, the blessing, and the power of the hand of God will cause the miraculous to happen in your life if you'll remove the excuses, amen, out of your life. You cannot allow doubt. You cannot allow fear to become a part of your life. Let me tell you, I'm going I'm to lay something on you very hard right now. When you allow fear and you allow doubt in your life and in your heart, that becomes a God to you. That becomes a God to you. 
And what does the Bible say in Revelation about the fearful and unbelieving? Anybody want to tell me? They're cast into the lake of fire. So you could get to the point that you allow fear and unbelief to, to rob you that even you are lost for all eternity. So we've got to remove these things. That's why we've got to pray. That's why we've got to fast. That's why we've got to come before God. God, you have put this in my heart. I want to see my friends say to school, God gave you that. You've got to pray. You can't say, well, they haven't come to church, Brother Yuspan. They're picking on me at church. They're picking on me at school. They're laughing at me. They're making fun of me. Amen, because I'm not doing the things that I used to do. No, no, no. You're going to pray. You're going to remind God, God, I'm going to see my friends say. God, I'm going to see my family say. God, I'm going to have revival. Amen. I'm going to be a watchman of the law. I'm going to cry out to God because you put it in my spirit. You put it in my heart. You put it in my life. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast until I know that your hand is upon me and you're going to give me the things that I need to do the work. So he said, King, I want you to supply me the materials that I need to rebuild my walls for my house and for the temple. A nobody Listen to me, a nobody was going to do a great work of God. And when he got to Jerusalem, he was going to face opposition. He was going to face problems. It wasn't going to be a, 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 a cakewalk. Yeah, he was going to have face problems. He was going to face opposition. He recognized, amen, the need that was before him, but he also recognized the hand that was upon him. Because go to chapter 2 and verse number 17. <coughs> he said, then I said unto them, you see the bad situation we're in? telling about the people that were with him that were looking at the walls of Jerusalem. How Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates are burned with fire. He said, come up, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a disgrace. Then I took them by the hand of my God, which was upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Amen. Nehemiah was not going to allow the situation. Nehemiah was not going to allow the problems to stand before him, the keeping from him him to do his accomplished goal and his accomplished purpose within his life. And so I'm telling you, you can live for God. You can serve God. You can live a life of victory. You can do a work for God. God can take you. God can use you. But it's time to rise up above the situation that you're in right now and let the burden grab your heart that I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to yield myself to God until I know the hand of God is upon me and God answers Amen. And God's going to give me what I need to accomplish the task. Amen. King Ahasuerus didn't say, you've got to find your own financing. You've got to find your own supplies. No, no, Nehemiah said, King, I want you to give them to me. And because he prayed and he fasted and he sought God and he was not going to allow what he did not have to stop him, God did the miraculous. <coughs> Nehemiah was not also, he was also not going to compromise his stand. He was going to stand upon the word of God and the promises of God. Verse number 19 of chapter 2. Now when Samballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us. Ha <laughs> ha, you think you're going to live for God? Ha 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 you're crazy. You think you can really pray? You think you really can do anything for God? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. And they spies us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? Oh, yeah, we know what you're doing. You, you, you're here under false pretenses. You're going to rebel against King Ahasuerus. He said in verse number 20, I answered them, the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or memorial in Jerusalem. There comes a time that we take a stand. And we're going to say, we're going to do what's right no matter what anybody else says. And when they try to interfere or they try to get us to compromise, amen, that we will let down who we are and what we believe, we are not going to let down. So Nehemiah was going to accomplish a miracle to build the walls, to restore the walls that were nothing but trash heaps as foundations. He was going to face obstacles that were before them from the enemies. And when the people said, you know, we can't do it, do this job, we can't accomplish this, Nehemiah said, yes, we can. Why? Because God's on our side. So they were willing to fight, 
and they were willing to build at the same time. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 10 through 18. Amen. I'm not going to read all those, eight, all, all those eight verses for time, but you read them afterward. Amen. But verse number 17, the Bible says, Those who built the wall and those who bore burdens loaded themselves for everyone that worked with one hand and held a weapon with the other hand. And every builder had his sword girdled by his side, and so worked. And so, amen, he who sounded the trumpet was at my side. I'm telling you, amen, when we recognize the burden, we recognize the calling, we'll work and we'll be ready to fight. And we're not going to quit. We're not going to give in. Amen. We're not going to put it down. We're not going to walk away until the job's done. And somebody say amen. Come on. I said we're not going to quit until the job's done. We are going to see accomplish what God has said he's going to accomplish. And because of that, they built the walls in how many days? Anybody remember? 52 days, the Bible says. A job that a contractor, man that would build, probably would have taken a year or more to do. They did in 52 days. They removed the trash. They removed the garbage. They restored and they rebuilt the foundations. And they put up the walls and they built the gates in 52 days. It was a miracle. But it all started with a man that did not look at what he had or what he did not have. And then he inspired the people with the same attitude. We may not have the strength. We may not have the ability. Sam Ballant and Tobiah and all those guys may be laughing at us and ridiculing us and making fun of us. But you know what? We're going to do it. We need a purpose in our heart. You know, those that are critical of this church, you know what? We're, we're going to have church anyway. Those that say we can't have revival, we're going to have revival anyway. The enemy may say, well, we have failed. No, no, we haven't failed. We're going to go anyway. Praise God. Because God has put it in my heart. God has put it in my spirit. God has put it in my soul. We don't need to be slow to start because when we're slow to start, we're resisting the move of God. But when God speaks, it's time to move. It's time to go. It's time to flow. That when the trumpet sounds, we will be ready to stand. We will be ready to go forth in Jesus' name. So an ordinary man named Nehemiah did not use the excuse, I don't have the ability, I don't have the knowledge to do the task that is before me. But he saw and he recognized that the hand of God was upon him. And by the power and by the blessing of the hand of God, he did the will he did the purpose of God. And you know what? If Nehemiah could do it, you can do it as well. But are you willing to recognize that? No, no. No, no longer making excuses. Well, I can't live for God, you know, because I don't know if I have it within me. I don't know if I can be dedicated. You know, I, 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 listen to yourself. I, 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 I. It's a bunch of noise. There's nothing definitive about it. But when you begin to say, I can because I prayed, I fasted, I sought God, and God has put this dream, God has put this burden, God has put this vision with inside of me, and because he can do it, I will rise, and my God is going to supply the things that I need, just like the king supplied Nehemiah the things that he needed. Amen. The building materials, the money, the, 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 the letters of safe travel. Even with opposition, when they said, well, we're going to go tell the king of Hazard to rebel. He said, I'm not worried about it because God's on my side. God's on my side. So here's what I want to leave you. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I can live for God. You can serve God. You can have the miracle that God has promised you. Don't allow doubt and fear to rob you of that miracle. Don't make excuses. Well, God, God, you know, I know, I, I, I know God will do it for Sister Francis, but God, you know, you know what? God won't do it for me. Or God will do it for Sister Cecilia, but God won't do it for me. Or God will do it for Brother Oscar, Brother Reyes, but you know, God, God won't do it for me. Or God will do it for Brother Uspan, Sister Uspan, but God, you know, God won't do it for me. Baloney, hogwash. If you believe God. You'll seek God because the burden, because of what you see and sense in your spirit gets a hold of you, that I want to see Jerusalem, I want to see the church be the praise of God on earth, and I will be the vessel, 
and I will be the hand of God to make it happen. And everybody say amen. Let's clap our hands. Let's praise the Lord right now. Let's magnify the Lord. Oh, come on. Let's love the Lord in Jesus' name. We worship you, God. We praise you, God. We love you, God.